Thank you for joining us today for our Remnant Church service. We're so glad that you've chosen to worship with us. Hope you had a great week, and we're so grateful that you've chosen this as your church family. You truly are a family here, and we're grateful for your presence each and every week online through your comments, the emails that we receive as, as a pastoral staff, and your, your letters. So we really appreciate all of those things. You know, I was reading in the Bible this week uh, about how God is such an amazing God that he has to describe himself in so many different ways, ways that we'll be able to comprehend. So he uses simple things like parables, or he, he uses names for himself like Wonderful Counselor, Everlasting Father, Jehovah Jireh, the Alpha and the Omega, the Beginning and the End, the Great I Am, the Creator, El Shaddai, and all of those things just to help us understand a little more about who he is. And so I hope you've taken this week as we've come during this Christmas season to remember he is also the chosen one. He is the anointed one. He is the Messiah. He is the savior of the world. And he came and he was born and dwelt among us because unto us a child is born. Unto us a child is given. A son is given. And I hope you've taken advantage of the fact of remembering that during this time and to be grateful. And with that uh, uh, gratefulness in your heart, with that ability to remember you've joined in church to worship your God and your Savior. Yes, there is power in the blood of Jesus Christ. There is power in the name of Jesus. So now as we begin our song service, I hope you'll sing with us these few songs. We're going to start off with power in the blood. Books. We're going to start with Power in the Blood. We're going to sing just the first stanza and the chorus twice because there is power in the name. And we're going to sing a few songs today regarding that there is power in the name. So blessed be the name of the Lord, that precious name. How sweet it is. Sing with us. Join up with us on page 294. 294, Power in the Blood. We'll sing just the first stanza. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. There is power. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. There you see once again, when we sing that song, that there is power in the blood, in the precious blood of the Lamb. Another way of us understanding about the sacrifice that Christ made. A lamb is something that is something we see, something we know, and during that time they knew what it meant to sacrifice the Lamb. And there is this name we praise. Blessed be your name, Lord. I hope that you can say that as we come to the end of this year. This is the, going to be the last Sabbath of 2020. I don't know if you recognize that or remember that, but it is the last Sabbath. And I know for some of you, 2020 was a difficult year for many of you around the world. doesn't matter if you're United States or other parts of the world. But you can, I hope, at this moment say, Lord, no matter what has happened, blessed be your name, your precious name, your holy name. Blessed be your name because from you we receive our strength. Sing with us this song. Blessed be the name. As you recall all that has happened in this year, you can still say, my friends, blessed be your name.
that came into your life they were not by chance they were not by your own doing but they were the blessings of your everlasting God because his name is so so sweet remember that we heard we sang part of that song from take the name of Jesus with you are you taking the name of Jesus with you wherever you go his precious name oh how sweet remember that when you call upon the Lord and you say his name and you confess that Jesus Christ is your Savior, I hope sometimes you may think he can't hear you, but I'm here to encourage you. Strength will rise when you wait upon the Lord. Maybe you've been waiting a whole year, two years, six months for that answer. Wait upon the Lord because his time is the best time. Sing with us our next song. Everlasting God, the Eternal Father, the Alpha and the Omega. Sing with us, strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God, the everlasting God. You do not fade. Defender of 
comfort those in need. You lift us up on wings like eagles. So we'll turn our eyes upon Jesus. of that song. You see, you don't just trust in any old God. It is not this gods you've heard of and, and, and that people speak about. He is the everlasting God, the one who will lift you up on wings like eagles. He's a defender of the weak. He comforts those in need. Is that you? Is that you right now? You may be thinking to yourself, a difficult year, a difficult week, a diagnosis you thought would never come that came for you, a family member, a child, a mother. And I'm here to tell you, you are trusting in a God that is the everlasting God. The name above all names. He does not faint. He does not grow weary. He is a God that you can depend upon. Great is his faithfulness. And so we sang the song at the end, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And then it says, the things of earth will grow strangely dim. Focus on the Lord, the everlasting God. And when you do, in those times you feel like you just cannot breathe, when things are so heavy upon your life that it's like a ton of bricks on your chest, I hope you'll breathe in the presence of God that you will allow yourself to say, I will run on nothing. I'm not going to run on, uh, on, on, on any ingredient except for the presence of God. His holy presence living in me. And what's going to be your food? His holy word. Daily bread. Because without it, you and I are lost. We'll sing with us this next song. It's entitled Breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my daily bread. Your very word spoken to me. And I'm desperate for you. Sing with us. Sing with us this last song together. As we end off this last Sabbath together of 2020. This is the air I This is the air I breathe, your holy presence living in me. This is my daily bread. This is my daily bread. This is my daily bread. This 
some other air, but I hope it'll now be God himself, that you will allow yourself to be surrounded by his presence each and every day. And I hope that your food wouldn't just be the normal food you eat, but the daily bread of his word when 2021 comes. Maybe you've set it aside, maybe you've forgotten about it, but when 2021 comes, my friends, feast on the daily bread, his holy word, because without it, we're lost. So I hope this time of praise and worship that we spent together, that you remember, blessed be the name of, that, of our Lord. Who is he? The everlasting God. And because he is, I want to breathe his breath. I want to know him intimately, and I want to feast on his word. May God bless you, because worthy is the Lamb. Amen. Good morning, what a year it has been. Can you believe it is, it is the last Sabbath of the year? Well, good morning. Um, we've been doing this all year in spite of what's been happening. We've been having our service. You've been fed spiritually, mentally, and physically. We try to encourage you. Today I'll be covering some, th some tips you know, as the uh, year has been really depressive, uh, stress. Uh, our sleep pattern has been interrupted, and so today and over the next time that I'm here, I'll try to give a couple of tips to improve uh, your sleeping. So how to fall asleep and stay asleep? The negative, the nagging headaches, persistent drowsiness, impeding ability to handle stressors, and increased agitation are taking their toll. The sleep medications stopped working weeks ago. 
With fatigue mounts anxiety and you can turn your brain off at night. You're exhausted and tossed and turn awake in, up in the middle of the night and feeling your games off during the day. Improving sleep does not come overnight, but it is well worth the effort to improve this imperative part of life. You're more likely keenly aware of the effects of sleep deprivation. If you're a swing night or swing night shift worker, a student pulling all-nighters, or a habitual sufferer of insomnia, the rules of sleep deprivation are real and overwhelming. More than one in three Americans does not get enough sleep. In fact, the average adult needs at least seven to nine hours of sleep. And missing one or even two of these hours of sleep at night can have negative impact to cognitive performance. Sleep deprivation, only, sleep deprivation not only comes with fatigue, decreased mental acuity, and reduced performance, but it's also associated with increased risk of developing chronic conditions such as obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, stroke, and frequent mental dis distress. Conversely, habitually sleeping more than nine hours a day is, associate, is associated with hypersomia, a condition with numerous mental health risk. If you're struggling with a chronic sleep disorder or a new unwelcome change to your sleeping pattern, there are inventions you can employ without resorting to ambient benzodiazepine. Even if you are currently taking sleep medications, um, the recommendations that I'll be making today, probably I'll just go over about one or two recommendations, but next time I'm here, I'll try to give some more recommendations that can really improve your sleeping pattern. Two chemicals, serotonin and melatonin, are intimately involved in, intimately involved with, with circadian rhythm, which is the body's 24 hour light dark sleep awake, sleep wake body clock. Both light and darkness at the proper time are needed to, to sleep e efficiently. The brain produces neurotransmitters to neurotransmitters serotonin known for their in, for influence in happiness and well-being with stimulation by light. At night, the brain turns serotonin into melatonin in the process of darkness. In order to fall asleep, heightened levels of melatonin in the brain are needed. The production of these two chemicals in, is influenced by numerous factors. Through the modification of these important brain chemicals, you can improve your ability to, to sleep efficiently. And so I'll co be covering a couple of the tips and how you can improve that. The first one, and probably I'll just do two tonight, today. S light exposure, sun exposure, depression, insomnia, and other conditions influence our ability to fo follow an, activi an active schedule, which can change how much exposure we have to the sun or daylight. Getting sun and light exposure throughout the day is important for maintaining the natural light-dark cycle needed for functioning optimally. The light exposure stimulates serotonin production. To maximize light exposure benefit, get 30 minutes of bright sun in the morning, ideally 10 minutes within waking up. During the winter months, I know that in some places in the world, they don't get a lot of sun, so there are other things that you can do to get that light, that natural light that is needed. Outdoor daylight is about 15 times brighter than any artificial indoor lighting. So it, if you are unable to be in natural light in the morning, it is wise to consider a medical grade light source. 
look for blue or white light that has 10,000 lux. Use your light therapy device for 30 to 60 minutes, as is recommended, 30 to 60 minutes each morning within 10 minutes of waking up at the time that you want to wake up, ideally before 7 a.m. It can take up to 10 days to respond to this treatment, but it is an effective approach to res resetting your circadian rhythm. If you are experiencing early morning awakening, use your light therapy 20 minutes, 12 hours opposite the time of a unawaken unwanted awakening time. That is, if you're getting up 2.30 a.m., use your light therapy 2.30 p.m. for 20 minutes. The other tip that I'll give for improving your sleep pattern and sleep cycle is choose in food that boosts your brain. Diets can influence sleep pattern. The body uses ammonia acid tryptophan in the biosynthesis of melatonin and serotonin. You can choose food naturally rich with tryptophan to provide good nutrition to your brain, such as pumpkin seed, seaweed, chia seed, sesame seed, and tofu. But you must note that tryptophan can only enter the brain in, con in concert with carbohydrates. Triacine, another important amino acid, improves stress, fatigue, sleeplessness, and mood when present in the brain. This also can be found in mustard seed, mustard green, watermelon, soybean, pumpkin seed, and tofu, but this also needs carbohydrate to enter the brain. This has been your health minutes for today. I pray that you'll have a good, blessed day and godly day. I'd like to join hands with the youth pastor and the elders of the church to welcome each one of you for our divine hour. Let me share with you God's holy word as we worship God on the last Sabbath of the year 2020. Make a joyful answer to the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with, thanks gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth all generations. As we prepare our hearts, may the Holy Spirit take control of us so that we will worship God in spirit and in truth. Our hymn of praise for this morning will be hymn number 350. Blessed be the tie that binds. Hymn number 350.
As we prepare to meet the Lord in prayer this morning, I have in my hand two sealed requests, which we'll be presenting to the Lord. And then I will be reading the names of those that have requested prayer today. And they are Mehareth, Ethiopia, Samson Fazge, Robin and Parveen Peter, Maxwell Paul and family, Babu Benjamin, Dr. and Mrs. C.P. Matthew, Shirley Harris and family, Suda Pillay, Annie Rainey, Liz Arulvas, Prathapan Isaac, Mr. and Mrs. Arulvas, Emil John, J.S. Paul, Janet Smith, Esther Singh and family, Brian and family, Ruthie, Mrs. Lakshma Beckham, Jay and Subhadra, Shashi Masi, Vimala and Binsi Mathai, John Gorday and family, Esther and Sheila Gorday, Jenny Sampson and Brandon, Murthy, the country of Armenia, Maya Foster, Nirmala Shavan, Joel Selvaraja, uh, Ponzi's family, Wansa, Sabina Gunta, Annie Matthew, Mr. Rasanayagam, Stacy Ann Martin for family and business, Shandu Shinta, Shoba Suresh, Priya Anand, the Roberts family, Tanya and Linda, Edwin Joseph, Ellen Cromwell, Jayanthi Eshra Rao, Gil family, Saul Florence, Sunny Jack and family, Antonia and Indra, Karen Roberts and family, Sydney, Lizzie Thomas, T.S. Abraham, Dilip and Usha Simpson, J Bobby and Joy Kurian, Ram Naidu, Isaac Shavan, Rita and Nita and Aruna Shavan and family, Rani and Murali, Dina, Amber Batra, Molly Nuthlapati, Sue Benjamin, Yomi, Patricia, Pastor Sajan John and family, Pastor Reggie and family, Alicia, Mrs. C.K. John, Miss Mason and family, Christopher Cole, Zabada and family, Rachel Phillip, Sean and Anne Marie, Padmakar and Susuma, Satya Narayana, Jackie, Sampath, Kumari, Philomena and Grace, Lovelina, Laban Rao, and the family of Charmaine Maxwell. As far as possible, I invite you to kneel as we pray, as we are led in prayer by Elder Samuel Massey. Our gracious, kind, and loving, merciful Father in heaven. Once again, it's our privilege to come before your throne of grace. We want to thank you, Lord, for giving us another opportunity to come before your throne of grace, presenting ourselves as just as we are. We want to thank you, Lord, for preserving our souls, keeping us alive, in spite of what is going around in the world around us, you have sustained us. We want to thank you, Lord, for all your goodness towards us. Because you are our Father, our Creator, and our Sustainer. And you have not dealt with us according to our iniquities, our sins. But in your mercy, you provided grace through your son who died on the cross of Calvary to set us free from the bondage of sin, for which we are so grateful and in response we are here to worship you. As now the whole world is in the mood of celebrating Christmas, we want to thank you for him. He is the reason for the season. Once again, O oh Lord, we present ourselves before your throne of grace, 
asking that you please forgive our sins and shortcomings that we have committed knowingly, unknowingly, innocently. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness and give us the robe of righteousness so that we may walk in the newness of life. And a few days, this year is going to end. And we are going to enter into another year which is unknown to us. We do not know what the future holds for us. But we know the one who holds the future for us. For which we are so grateful to you, O Lord. We want to thank you for the church family, you have been good to every one of us, preserving us, taking care of us in the time as such as this. We want to thank you, Lord, for every member of the church. Continue to bless them. Especially we uplift the ones who've been sick for a long time and this Church has been praying for them. Ask that you please continue to be with them. Stretch your healing hand upon them and give them the healing touch so that your name may be praised. We want to thank you, Lord, for this church has witnessed many miracles. And we do believe, and it's our faith, you still perform miracles. Please be merciful to every one of them. We pray for the ones whose names were read out in the prayer list. Ask that you be with them as well. Grant to them the desires of their heart and give them the healing touch they need. We also want to thank you, Lord, for the leadership of our church at various levels. We want to thank you for Pastor Surgeon and his ministry. Continue to bless him and his family. You also pray for Reggie and his ministry. Thank you for him and his wife. Ask that you continue to use them for honor and glory to your name. Once again, also, Lord, we pray for the ones who had joined us online to worship you. Help us, O oh Lord, that we may all realize the tenderness of the time that we are living in. We know, Lord, this world is not our home. We are just passing through. Your coming is very soon. The signs around us shows us the prophecies are being fulfilled before our eyes. Therefore, O oh Lord, please accept us we are, forgive us our sins and shortcomings, and prepare us for the eternal kingdom when Jesus comes to take us back home We'd make to be ready to be ushered into his kingdom where there will be no more pain, no more suffering, no more pandemic. You would have wiped away all tears from our eyes. All these blessings we pray in the worthy name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> Yesterday, we celebrated the birth of our Savior, and with that, one of the greatest offerings ever made. 
we all know the story. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh were some of the most valuable commodities in the world at that time. And we know that they're still valuable today. And apart from being special gifts and valuable gifts, they provided Jesus' poor family with valuable resources and may have even aided them financially uh, in a very difficult time in escaping to Egypt. God and the church are not asking for your most valuable possessions, but your offerings as we uh, celebrate and worship for the last time this year, I urge you to remember how they help your church and your community through a difficult time and a difficult year. John Kennedy will minister to us in music.
us pray. Our glorious Heavenly Father, we thank you for another Sabbath that we can worship you and look upon you. And we thank you for, although a difficult year, a blessed and abundantly wonderful year. We, we, we ask now that you take our offerings and use them for your work and your purpose so that we may continue to look upon thee. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Auntie Sashi Masi Masi will uh, give the children's story. Happy Sabbath, boys and girls. I'm sure you had a very nice Christmas yesterday. And most of you must have received a lot of gifts. And I'm very sure that all of you must have been so excited to open your gifts. Am I right? I'm sure you enjoyed the gifts that your parents, your loved ones, your friends, they gave to you. And I'm, today, my story is also entitled, Surrounded by the Gifts. Actually, I wanted a picture over there with the child with all the gifts, but I don't know. So today, the story, I'm going to tell you about a girl whose name is Sarah. Sarah was in a prison. I think she did something wrong, so she had to be in the prison. But... The king of that country was very happy to see Sarah. Sarah was a very sweet little child. So the king said, I have to release this girl from the prison. So he let Sarah go home. When Sarah went home, this king, he was very, very happy to see Sarah. She was a beautiful little child. So this king fell in love with her. He loved her like her own child. So he started sending gifts to her. So every time Sarah was receiving gifts, she would open and just leave them. Another time, again in the afternoon, she would see some gift for her. She would go pick it up, open, and leave it there. This way, it went on. Every morning she had a gift. Every day she had a gift. She took it for granted, all the gifts that she was receiving. She thought, oh, that's okay, I'm receiving this gift. But there was a deal with the king. He said, I'm going to release you from the prison, but you have to serve me. So she was taking for granted all these gifts, and she was piling and sitting around it, but she never thanked or she never thought about the gifts. One particular afternoon, she was just waiting for one package to arrive but it not arrive. Why? Because maybe she didn't need it, but she wanted that gift. So she was waiting, and she was not enjoying the gifts that were around her. So many gifts she has, but she just wanted to wait for that gift, and she was very sad. So she had a sister whose name was Mary. She walked in. She said, what happened, Sarah? She said, I haven't received a gift that I'm supposed to. She said, are you sure you need that gift? She said, yes, I do need the gift. She said, I don't think so, you need that gift. If it was important, if it was necessary, I'm sure the king would have sent that gift to you, but you have to go without it. She was not very happy. She was groaning about that. Why, I haven't received that gift. Then it so happened that she said, Sarah, remember, the gifts that we have are very precious. And Sarah said, no, I only like the gifts that I get it and that are more good, more better than other people. If somebody gives her a gift, she was not very happy. But at the same time, she was happy only when she got her own gift, what she wanted. And now Mary said, we have to be very happy or very pleased with whatever we have. So she made her sister understand that, you know, whatever 
we have or the if the king needed you to have that gift to serve him better i'm sure he would have sent you so here she said sarah understood the understood the what her sister told her and she gave a big hug to her sister and said i'm sorry i understand the importance of the gifts so she feel better she relieved she got a really little relief from the story that the what her daughter talked to her her sister talked to her and she was very very happy actually i was looking for the picture you know i have a granddaughter whose name is arya and she was so excited to receive all the gifts she got on the christmas day and the same way children we just have to remember one thing that we have a jesus who released us from the sin like the way the king released sarah he has released us from the sin secondly children you have to remember all the gift that we get is from jesus he has given us so many gifts but sometimes we take it for granted the gifts like we have our family we have our church family we have friends we have our loved ones everybody is surrounded by you and they love you and they give all the gifts and love for you the same way jesus also loves us and he has given us all these gifts because he loves us so just remember that jesus loves us a lot thank you shadows deepen we do do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through we do do you wish that you could see it all made new we do Is a new creation coming? It is. Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? It is. Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is. Wait, wait. 
with the Son. Is He worthy? Is He worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is He worthy? Is He worthy? Is He worthy of of Judah. Jesus indeed is worthy of our worship. Cornerstone, thank you so much for uplifting our spirit, giving us a little taste of heaven by your talents of praising God. We truly appreciate your service here. We also would like to thank John Kennedy for blessing with the song. I'd like to join hands with the youth pastor Reggie Samuel and all the elders of the church to welcome each one of you for our divine hour. We are so happy that you are joined to worship with us. And it is my prayer that as we worship him, spirit and in truth, that we would have a better glimpse of him. As Alex pointed out that this is the last Sabbath of the year 2020. Can you imagine how fast this year has gone by? But more than that, how grateful we are that God has been kind and gracious to us. We thank God for his faithfulness to each one of your lives. And may the Lord richly bless you. May the Lord richly bless you as we worship him in spirit and truth. We do have a number of visitors here that I'd like to that names were given to me. We have Dow Taylor, Stacy Ann Martin, Ruth Richmond, Charmaine Maxwell, Elizabeth Pushrotson's family from Ireland, Sunny Jack from Canada, Rebecca Worrell, Joseph Surrelly, Esther Singh, Karen Roberts, Rose Lida Nagboki, Lavon Wharton, Leon Bess, Barbara Mary from Mountain View, California, Hepsi Joseph, Amber Lynn Johnson, Clifton Coilpillai, Pradeep Suranjan from Bangalore, John Moses, Linsdale Rittman, Sony Bhavani, Masil Selagala, and Sampath Jairaman. And I'm sure there are a few more names that was not turned in here, but I'm sure there are many more who are worshipping with us. We want to thank God for you. Thank you for being the extended family, the Remnant Church. May the Lord richly bless you as we worship him in spirit and truth. We do have a number of visitors here and a uh, number of uh, announcements here, by the way. Now, I'd like to have a mic, please. If you can send one mic. Is this working now? All right. The flowers that you find here are uh, presented by Neil and Sonu and the grandparents, Mr. and Mrs. Enabari and Mr. and Mrs. Vijay Jaladi their uncle and auntie, Mr. and Mrs. Asha Pillai, to thank God for the grandchild, the power, Ayan, celebrating his eight, completing his 18th month. And they really want to thank God for every month that the Lord has blessed Ayan with. So Ayan, we want to wish God's richest blessings as you continue to grow and be a source of joy and happiness, not only to the parents, to the grandparents, to uncles and aunts, and to the church family. We truly Praise God for your life. I also would like to take this opportunity to thank all the carolers throughout the month. You did come out every night here except for Friday night. And we were able to bring cheers of joy into the homes of so many. I also want to, would like to thank everyone who allowed us to come into your homes via Zoom. It has been a blessing to us to minister to you and I'm sure you have been a blessing to us. 
And in case if you have not sent in the money for the caroling towards, that goes towards the building fund, please make sure that it is dated December 31st. It should be earmarked 31st of December so that it, will pay, it can be counted for your tax purpose for the year 2020. So please keep that in mind. The new quarterlies are here. It's, from the, it's on the book of Isaiah. I'm sure you would like to be blessed, and so please do drop by and pick them up. I also would like to remind you that we will be celebrating the Lord's communion on the 31st night, the New Year's service. It's going to be at 7.30. Kindly keep this in mind. 7.30, we'll have the New Year's service where we'll be celebrating the Lord's communion. So please do come by and pick up the bread and wine so that you can be blessed. Because we want to begin the new year with God's richest blessings. So please do join us and, be, and uh, please make sure you pick up the, the bread and the wine. We also would like to thank you for your giving, for your sacrifice, for all what you have done. We have truly been blessed. We thank you for your patience. And it's my prayer that as we end the year, that we would end the year in a very strong note. And that is possible because of your sacrificial, faithful giving that you have given to each one of us, and we want to thank you for that. And it's my, again, I just want to remind you, anything that needs to be counted towards 2020 for your tax purposes, your giving must be marked December 31st. So please keep this in mind so that all of us can be richly blessed. Now, although we, those of us, uh, are celebrating the last Sabbath of the year, some of our members have been struggling with life. This morning, I'd like to uplift two individuals and request every one of you, the ones who are joining us, including our members, your, our faithful members who join with us to worship God every week. We thank you for that. Kindly keep Padmaka Kale, who is in the ICU at Harvard Community Hospital in Columbia, and also Chendu Chinta, who is in Georgetown Hospital, is also in ICU. Both are in a very challenging situation. In fact, with regard to Chendu, the doctors have given up. Only God can intervene and perform a miracle in his life. Last night, we were able to anoint him via Zoom, and uh, I'm sure Sedeka and uh, the children, Sean and Isha, would rejoice, would be happy, not rejoice, will be appreciative of you keeping Chendu in your prayers. Just this morning, I texted and said, Sadika, we are praying for Chendu and for all of you. She texted back saying that, Pastor, um, that's very true. God is still on the throne. We are waiting for a miracle. So here's what we're going to do. Wherever you are, please join with us. We are going to kneel and seek God's intervention in the life of Padmakar and in the life of Chendu. So God can perform a miracle, revive them, bring them back, so that his name can be glorified. Let's pray. Our God in ages past, our hope for years to come. This morning in the holy sanctuary as we are gathered here, few of us, as a joint hands, with the host of people all around the world, friends, well-wishers, and every one of our faithful members. We come to you with a great burden in our heart because you are the burden carrier. We come to you because you are our help. You are our fortress. You are our healer. What is impossible for man is possible with you. And so, loving Father, I plift Padmaka Kale. It's my prayer, Lord, that you would go right now into the room, into the ICU room that he is in Howard Community Hospital. That you stretch your healing hand upon him and touch him and heal him. Loving Father, have mercy upon your son. Likewise, I pray for Chandu, who is in ICU in Georgetown Hospital. Loving God, although the doctors might have given up, because with us as human beings, there are limitations. Even the doctors, there are only certain, so much they can do. But with you, loving Father, 
you can bring about that perfect healing because your hand is not shortened, your power is not diminished. You're still on the throne, you're still hearing prayers, you're still answering prayers. You're still in the business of performing miracles. And so I plead with you and I beg you and I beseech you as I join hands with the members of the remnant church and the well wishers and friends all around the world. Please, loving Father, walk into that icy room and please stretch your healing hand and touch him. With these two individuals, loving Father, may a precious blood run through every part of their body from the head to the foot. That every organ, every cell, every tissue might be energized, renewed, so that they will come back to better health and even walk into your sanctuary and glorify your name. And so this morning, with the host of your saints, I commit Padmaka Kali and Chendu Chinta into your care and keeping. Embrace them with your love. Fill them with your spirit. Touch them with your healing touch. This is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Happy Sabbath, Church. The scripture reading for this morning is taken for, uh, from the book of uh, 1 Corinthians, verse 12 to 14. For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. God bless his word. Happy Sabbath, church. Yeah, it's good to see just, uh, you know, there's a few of us here and I get to hear Happy Sabbath back. That's great. I can't wait till the time I get to hear a little more Happy Sabbath when all of us are joined together here in the pews. Um, I'm going to continue my series, uh, well, I'm actually be ending a series entitled Old and New, Old and New. And if you haven't been able to uh, see those sermons or hear them, just realize that I'll be building upon things that were said previously. So if you feel like some things were unsaid in this particular sermon, um, it may be because I touched upon them uh, in, in previous sermons as we've gone through this journey together regarding old and new. Before we begin, let's say a word of prayer. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for all you are. We thank you for all you've done. And today, Lord, I ask that you forgive me of my sins. Hide me behind your cross. I am unworthy to speak your words. Touch my lips and put your words into my mouth that we may be able to see you more clearly, hear you more clearly, and to serve you more wholeheartedly is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a quick recap, as I've done before when I'm doing a series of sermons, I understand that not everyone may remember. Um, sometimes I don't even remember certain things. And so I just want to do a quick recap of the things we've talked about regarding uh, our sermon here. Um, in our first sermon, it was entitled Old and New Perspectudes. And I made up a word combining perspectives and attitudes, hoping that 
when we do look at something differently, that when we change our perspective about something, that our attitude toward that thing will also change. And so we, the new perspectives that I was proposing we need to have was that we needed to have um, put people over preferences to focus on the potential of another instead of the problems they bring. Focus on being a lover of people instead of the lawyer against them. And finally, focus on the blessing of a soul saved instead of the blunders they made. Um, the reason I keep those little things in mind is so that you'll remember that we talked about them, but that those are things I was saying we need to focus on. It wasn't that I was saying that we should forget uh, people's problems or you know, to help them through them, no. It was that we should focus, change our focus a little bit, change our perspective a little bit, so their attitudes will be able to be reflective of one that is similar and in the likeness of God. The la second sermon was entitled, Old or New. And this last sermon is kind of a culmination of that second sermon. If I could have given it all at once and people had the attention span of more than an hour and a half, then I may have given that sermon altogether. But seeing that that is not a, a helpful way of preaching, I had to break it up. The two things we talked about in that previous sermon was growing, not groaning. Growing, not groaning. And in that sermon, we explored the aspect of when we come to church or even in our own daily lives, we have to learn that we can't be upset for every change. For every change that may occur, we can't be a groaner. We, instead of having growing pains, which happens when there's change, we instead embrace groaning pains. And that's something that we should shy away from. Instead of groaning. And I talked about the fact that we should change for the better and not simply for the sake of change. You know, sometimes young people will say, well, we've been doing this for so long, let's just change it. Well, is that really a good reason to change something just because you've been doing it for so long? But what if that way is the best way? And so we talked about that and unpacked that a little bit. And finally, in that sermon, we talked about having effective ministries and not defective ministries. Speaking to the real needs of people, not being out of touch not talking about things from 80 problems that were occurring 50 years ago when those problems don't occur right now. And we looked at the example of Jesus. Jesus was one who went to the woman in Samaria and spoke to her specific need. Not a general need, but a specific one. And, he, and, the, and we looked at what Mrs. White said, saying that Jesus would present the truth in the most beautiful way. He would make, she says, truth beautiful. And he presented truth in the most attractive way. Her words, not mine. And so we talked about what that meant when we reach out to our youth, to our young people, to our um, ministries that we have. Are we just trying to keep the status quo? Or are we actually trying to meet the needs and minister to the needs of our young people? And that's where I kind of unpacked that. So if you forgot those things, those are the things we talked about. Now let's go into the sermon for today. The title of our sermon for today is Old and New Together. You see, in my previous sermon, I asked the question, old or new? And that was really the wrong question. It was purposefully. Because we have to stop putting the word old for, for, for um, younger people who say, oh, old, and the connotation immediately is, is it's useless, it's not good, it's something we throw aside. No, I wanted to get away from that thing. Don't think that way. For some people, we'll say, you know, there's a saying, old is gold. They are good things that we hold on to, that we do, that we think, and how we've done things, and, and conventions, best practices, so to speak, that you learn. If those of you that are in business, you do a lessons learned, and sometimes the lesson you learned is the things you've been doing for the past 15 years are the best practice. That being said, there are many of us in the next generation, the older generation, that when we hear the word new, we lose our minds. Oh, no, we can't do any of it. We can't do ministry in a new way. We have to do exactly the same way we've been doing it for the past hundred years because the word new just, it, it's, oh, then if we have a new thing that they're going to do this, they're going to change that, they're going to, we go down a, a list of a hundred things when all we said, we just want to change the color of the door. Like, no, we can't have a new color door. That door has been the same color for the past 50 years. And it's like, what are you, what are you, what are you saying? And so I'm trying to get away from those connotations we have regarding old and new. Old and new together. And I want to present to you the case that when those things mesh, when we allow ourselves, and I'm not talking about truth, and I'll say that a bunch of times so that no one misquotes me, I'm not talking about old truth and putting new truth or something like that. There are pillars of our faith. I am not talking about those things. I'm talking about ways we do things, 
how we do things, how we present the word, those kinds of things that are, um, and I've talked about that already, so I'm not going to speak about it further, that are traditions that some are good and we keep, but some we have to be okay to change. The best thing we can do is, as we'll see, reflect the image of God. As you think about old and new together, I'm going to present the case to you that the best way the church can move forward is not when we just pander to everything the young person says and not just hold on to everything the older person says when it comes to church, but when we actually work together and be able to meet the needs of each generation in a way that will allow us to reflect the image of God. Let me explain. I want you to think of the, and we think about this verse, Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, in many different ways. I want you to think about this image of God in terms of the church, not just you individually. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. The Bible tells us that we are made in the image of God. But it wasn't just that word created man is not male, but humankind, mankind. So it is referring, and that's why the Bible says further, male and female he created. And they are both made to reflect the image of God. And then the Bible says, so then God told them, go be fruitful and multiply, to have offspring so that they can further that image of God. But what is this image of God? If you think about it, Genesis 1 verse 26, the Bible says, So let us make man in our image. Now stop. I'm not going to go through over the whole theology of the Trinity. I'm going to assume that we understand the theology regarding the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Terms that we will understand. Three in one. Three persons in one. And when you think about that image of that, they said, let us make man in our image. May it be that they reflect who we are, a Godhead who works together, a Godhead who is separate, many members, but one body. I hope that makes sense. And so when we look at the image of God and we say, hey, oh yeah, I'm creating the image of God, so there is a dignity I have, there is a a, a love that is within me, but let's extend that a little further. Because I would argue to you that the reason the Bible tells us we're made in the image of God is because God is a God of relationship. That's why the Bible can say God is love. Love cannot exist when only a singular person exists. Self-love is not the love the Bible talks about. Love in the Bible is other-centered love. And so if we understand God to be a God of relationship, it makes sense that when it says the Bible... Uh, he created in the image of God, male and female, because there had to be not just one in the image of God, because even the Godhead is not made up of just one, but three in one. Am I, I'll make, if I'm making sense to anybody here. Just a head nod. I'll unpack it a little further. So that being said, when we now come to 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12, and the Bible says, For as the body is one and has many members, But all the members of that one body, being many, are what? One body. So also is Christ. In the same way that God, Christ is the head of the church. There's one body of Christ. And we as members, like the Godhead, have to then work together. And in that way, people will see the image of God. How? How, Reg? How is that possible? Just because we work together? No, 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 no. Think about it. Think about it. You and I, when we were able to meet in church, and if you looked two pews down to the person and three per people over, you'd be like, well, that person's like just the exact opposite of me. You know, they have a different hairstyle. They have a different uh, outfit. They're a different gender. They're a different age. The fact of the matter is, each of us in different ways are able to then reflect the image of God. None of us individually are able to reflect who God really is. Does that make sense? Because if you think about it, we do our best, but the best representation that we can make to the world is when the world sees a church made up of many members who are diverse 
and yet are one body. Think about it. You're different personalities that we come into church with, bringing a piece of the image of God. You see, some of you are patient, and some of us are not. You bring in that patience that we need in church board meeting. And some of you are, are, are the diplomats. You're able to look at something and say, let's reconcile this, guys. Let's bring this together. And then there's the other person who's the real, has the leadership qualities. You know, they're ambitious, but they can also be hard-headed. But they bring that ability to, for, to move things forward. They're able to get things done. I showed this to you before regarding the different personalities. We have different ages and different talents. When it comes to personalities, I showed you this four different personality types. Now, this is just an idea for you to understand that we're not all the same. That's why we disagree. And when we come into a, a meeting or come into a church, there's some of you who are cholerics. Cholerics are those people I talk about, those ambitious, they're, excuse me, um, efficient, they're leaders, they're confident, but they have weaknesses. And their weaknesses is that, as it says up there, they can be intolerant, they can be demanding. Do you know some of those people? Are you one of those people? And then you have another person who's the opposite of them, who's like a phlegmatic. A phlegmatic over here is a, is a reliable person, diplomatic, but they're shy. They're really shy. They like to be in the backgrounds. The clerics are the ones that you might see up front, but the phlegmatics are the people that are in the background. They, they want to do stuff, but they don't want to be up front. That's not their thing. Now, doesn't that make sense? Because don't we need all of them? What if we only had clerics in this world, in our churches, in our church board meetings, in our leadership staff? If you only had clerics, they just butt heads all day long. And so in our churches, we see, hey, I'm able to bring that leadership quality that, that we need. But you, <laughs> you, you over there, you have this social aspect. You're that hospitable person that everyone can talk to. I need you to be able to be there as well. And I need that person who's diplomatic, who can make those relationships between people and be the mediator. Now, when I say all of these things, you can see each quality in a different person, but a quality that is shown in the image of God, one who's a leader, one who's able to bridge the broken, uh, to cross the broken bridges, the person who is able to be hospitable, to put a smile on their face and make someone feel encouraged, all different parts of who God is reflected in the body of Christ. Different ages. Let's be real. In a church, you have people from the age of zero till 120. I don't know if there's actually a person 120 here, but how then do you work? It would be so much easier, right, if everyone was between the ages of uh, 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 50 and 70, and then we have a church for them, and then we have another church for... No, 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 but that doesn't reflect the image of God. It doesn't. All those ages, when it comes to the wisdom and the, the experience of those that are older, like the wisdom of God, we need them because they will help mentor us and usher us into a place the young people have no idea. But then we need the, the youthfulness, we need the energy, we need the ideas, the creative ideas of the young people because when we put them together, what do we get? The image of God within the church must be reflected, and that's only accomplished within that one body. Many members, one body, old and new together. Finally, our different talents. I mean, let's be real. Not all of us are Bible scholars. But what if you only had people who were Bible scholars in the church? You know, they knew their Bibles inside out, but they weren't necessarily the most hospitable people. They didn't know how to cook food. They didn't know how to have potluck. They didn't know how to put a smile on their face necessarily and be able to feel so, make someone feel encouraged just by their presence. You know, they were smart and intelligent, but they didn't have the other skills. We need them all. We need the hospital. We need the person who's good at finances. Now, you may be a good preacher, but you don't know how to deal with the finances of the church. That's why we have a church. Many members, many functions, many ideas, one body. And all of it is under what I'm trying to present to you is the best representation that the world can see of the image of God. Different people, different ages. Some of you are, 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 are able to be, do the hospitality. Some of you are teachers. Some of you are preachers. Some of you are able to show compassion and a warmth that others just don't naturally have. Some of you have the gift of wealth 
an influence in the world. Some of you are good at singing and music and others are not. Some of you have uh, good counsel to give, everyday life. Some of you are good at technological things and we need that. I mean, look in the world we live in. What if we didn't have those? And so you see all those things come together in no other place but the church. No other place has a group of people from the ages of zero to 100. No other place has a place that's made up of different races and ethnicities and personalities and talents except the church because it is the best representation of the image of God. Now, does that make sense? Head nod. Can I get one, Cliff? You good? Okay. All right, thanks. So that being said, we then come because Paul understands, hey, Reg, I know we've got all these different types of people, all these different types of ways of doing things. And then he comes, yeah, I know what's going to happen if that's the case. And so he advises against it. What, look what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 25 and 26. I'm reading from the New King James Version. And it says, there should be no schism. Interesting word. For those who don't know what that means, I've put it there. It means a division or discord in the body. But that the members should have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Again, think about that all the members, one member suffers. When Jesus suffered, who else suffered? Yeah. It was God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. There was a suffering in the Messiah. And it says the Messiah was cut off. There was a gut-wrenching thing happening. What does, that, does that occur in, your, in our churches, in your church around the world? I know some of you attend different churches. Think about it there. Because the Bible says there should be no schism. There should be them and us. There should be no us and them. There should just be us. And if we are to reflect the image of God, well, then we're going to have to work together. We're going to have to figure these things out. There should be no schism. And that's what I find difficult. I find a lot of people, you want to hear about how the church is failing. You know, constantly talking about, the, oh, the church didn't do this. The church, oh, that, look what the church is doing. There's this meeting going on. And you, you, we get alarmed and we, we, we put so distrust and doubt within the minds of our young people. And then we wonder why young people aren't coming to church. Let me just present to you the fact that if you're one of those people, stop. There is a time and a place where, you know, there's a check on what is being done, but there's another place where you're just doing it just to sow distrust. You need to be careful with that. Mrs. White says, um, I think it's five testimonies. I have written somewhere. But she talks about the fact that there's so much bitterness that is spread that spiritual discernment declines. And when you build up that bitterness and you're the source of that bitterness, you're adding to the spiritual decline of the church. So I want you to be clear there. Let there be no schism. Let's work together, old and new together. Your ideas, let's put them together. Which leads me to this. We must be cooperative, not competitive, in our churches. Wherever church you may be. Are you a cooperative person or are you a competitive person? What do I mean by that? You see, how do you put all these things together, Reg? This person has a lot of influence and wealth, but they don't really help out in the church. But you need that person because you can't do the ministry of having these cameras and broadcasting and the equipment that we need and stuff with the person that has the resources for it. But then we also need the people who may not have the resources but have the ability. How do we put it all together? We have a person who wants to, uh, we, we talk about the, what we have in, in this church and what this church is well known for, praise God, is a, a health minute, a health message to let people know the health laws of God. And then you have those with the, that want to talk about prophecy and, and the outreach. And we're saying, oh, I need these funds, and you need these funds, and I'm going to pull it on my side because my ministry is more important. <laughs> Ever heard, that, heard yourself say that? That's what I'm trying to say. When we are one body, we will work cooperatively, not competitively. We cannot say to... The, the foot cannot say to the brain, send all the blood here. If this, if, let's say the foot is some ministry. Let's say youth ministry. I, I'll put myself on the line. Youth ministry. 
let's, let's put all the blood, all the resources, everything that we do is going to go all the way to the feet and we're going to forget about everything. You say, brain, send everything. And what's going to happen to you if all the blood from your brain rushes to your feet? Anybody know? You'll, yeah, you, you'll, you'll pass out. And now what good are the feet? You can't move. Because the foot was competing with the brain, the whole body fails. Likewise, the brain says, I'm not giving you guys, or the heart says, I'm not going to give you any blood. No more blood. Let's all put the blood in the heart. You go, oh, you have an enlarged heart. But you can't move. You can't do anything because every part of your body needs blood. Am I making sense? We work cooperatively, not competitively. Don't look to your own ministry as the only most important ministry of the church. Even the ministry of the janitorial services in this church are super important. Even the custodial services... You don't get to see what happens because you walk into church and you have your ministry done and you leave, but those are important. And Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He says, those things that are unseen, those are things that are not presentable, are where the most uh, uh, resources are sent. We have to recognize, church, that cooperatively we can make the image of God so apparent to the world that, we'll say, that they'll say, Y'all should be competing with each other. How is it that you're cooperating with each other? We must begin to realize that the, instead of our gifts being diametrically opposed or polar opposite, that they are in fact complementary, not competitive. The fact is the church is intergenerational, it's interracial, it's interability, interideas, intersocioeconomic. You may have the ability, I may have the resources, we need each other. Why? Because we are trying to reflect the image of God so that the world will know Him. We are not here to fill pews. We are not here to get amens. We are here to finish the work. And when our eyes are on the prize, we're going to run that race in such a way that we work together. For those of you that are constantly complaining about something, give up the spirit of complaining in 2021. And instead, embrace the spirit of cooperation. That's not to say don't let your, your needs be known and things like that. Of course not. Of course not. The church is there for those various reasons. But you know the spirit of bitterness and complaining. If 80% if of what you say is complaining, that's what I'm talking about. If it's the 5% that you wish something was different, that's different. Okay. Give that up. We can't move forward. We're going to keep moving backward and backward because of the complainers and the groaners. But if we can move forward... The, cooperatively, reflecting the image of God, hey, 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 Jesus, Jesus will surely save. And so when I'm preaching here regarding old and new, I'm being a voice to the youth, I am in no way saying, forget every ministry, forget anyone over the age of 35. No, of course not. It's ludicrous. What I'm saying is sometimes we need to put a focus on the member that may be suffering, the member of the body, that the, that the uh, 1 Corinthians 12 talks about. And when we do so, we'll then for a time put more thought into what we do regarding that particular thing that may be suffering. I know those of you, there are many churches around the world, you're a parent or a parent of this church and your child is not in church. Your child doesn't believe in God. Your child doesn't believe in, in, in uh, following the Bible or Jesus. I know I'm speaking to you too. It shouldn't be the case. Not that the church can win everyone. The Bible tells us, Paul says, I've been all things to all men that I might save some. But are we doing the best we can? Are we putting our best foot forward? Are we allowing the image of God to be seen by these young people? Because I tell you, and we'll get to that later, truth will win them. When people said save the whales in, in the 1990s, they weren't saying forget every other species of animals. They were just saying the whales are endangered. So let's focus on the whales for a little time until they're no longer an endangered species. And then, same thing with other movements going on. That's the idea. What is it that you and I can do cooperatively as a church, within your church? First is, old and new together. It is the best representation of the image of God. And what do I mean by that? And the Bible says, and Paul says the same thing in 1 Corinthians 12, Jew or Greek, free or slave, it doesn't matter. All are part of one body. 
and as one body, we have to move together. I've had different sermon lessons, so I won't go through it, but if you tell, you know, if one leg says, I want to go this way, another says, like, I want to go this way, where are you going to go? Absolutely nowhere. You're going to stay right in the same spot you are. And sometimes our churches can become stagnant. Maybe your church, wherever you are, is because everyone wants to pull in their own direction because they're not putting people over preferences. They're putting preferences over people. I want to do it this way. Why? Well, it's because I like it this way. I don't think it should be done that way. Was there a biblical reason or preserved prophecy? No, I just don't think it's right. Which is the better? That's why we have church board meeting. And so I say to you, cooperation is way better than competition when it comes to the church, my friends. Let's work together. And as such, I will not see Alex as a threat to me. No one is a threat to me. You know what they are? They're beneficial to me. They're going to help me in my walk. Because when my foot is hurt, they're going to give me an arm so that I can, they can help me across the aisle. I'm not going to see, well, well, this person's gaining a little popularity, you know, they're going to... This is not a competition. <laughs> this is cooperation. And so if the older folks, I'm going to say a few words to the older folks and to the younger folks as I close my sermon, um, close my series today. The younger folks are not here as a threat. They're not. We need them just as much as we need you. No one is saying, you know, never again will you play the piano. Never again will you do this. No, 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 not at all. In fact, I would encourage our young people to whoever you may be going to see who may have been a mentor to you, someone who has helped you along your way, to take a moment and say thank you. We don't do that enough. Our older folks need to know, and I want you to know, I say thank you. Thank you for everything you've done for the Adventist church, for the church as a whole. Thank you for your sermons. Thank you for your songs of praise. Thank you for your prayers that taught me that I can speak to God. Thank you for teaching me those hymns that I can sing in the closet of my room when I am down. Thank you for teaching me the truths of the Bible in a way that has changed my life. Thank you for giving me opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. What you have done does not go unnoticed by the Lord. We must be grateful, younger people, because you wouldn't be here in the church or hearing a sermon if it wasn't for the older folks. For the people that went to the, in, in, my, in my situation, and many people who come from different countries, your grandfather just happened to attend a church when he was 15 years old, even though he was a Hindu. But because of that, his whole life was changed. And now you know the truth and you know God and you have hope because of what the old had done. Be grateful for that. Be grateful for that. That being said, to the older, our church does a great job of this. Maybe your church needs to, maybe it's at your church or maybe, and I say these things not as an indictment against our church, but as an encouragement as a reminder, I'm not going to be here forever, but maybe later on, when things start going a different way, you've got to learn to pass the baton. It's the only way we can run the race. Let me give you an illustration, older folks. If you're in a 400-meter race, and it's a relay race, and you're competing against other people who are in the top of their game, and you decide, you know what? I'm going to run this 400-meter race all on my own while everyone else has four people running 100 meters each. Who wins that race? Not you. You're trying to run the entire 400 meters by yourself with the baton because you think you'll do the best because the other person's not capable. But the fact of the matter is the other teams, they're running 100 meters. They have a lot of energy, and the person they hand it off to has the same amount of energy you had when you started. And therefore, they can run the race and pass it off at the next 100 meters for the 300, and they keep passing it and passing it. But some of us, you know, we're at past 100 meters and we're going 130, 150, 160. Thank you for running the extra 60 meters, but you know, it's time. It's time to pass the baton. It doesn't mean you're not on the team. You still are on the team. But you don't have to run as much anymore. You can take a break. <laughs> because we want to finish the race. We want to finish the work. And the best way to do that is when you think of the relay race, like when when Paul talks about running, finishing our race individually, I would extend it even to as a church. There is no pastor that can do the same thing that when he was 20 can do when he's 80. It's just not possible. 
God, in his ultimate mercy, when Moses was the leader, made sure Joshua was going along with him. All that time, going up to the mountain, learning from Moses. But Moses wasn't, when, when it was time for Moses to be done, Moses wasn't telling God, no, no I think I got still more, a few more good years. The Bible tells us Moses was still alert. You realize that? And Moses still had it going. When, he, when God told him, you're not going to enter the promised land. His eyes were not dim, was the Bible says. But it was time to pass the baton. And that's okay. You are still there to mentor. You are still there to guide. But now it's time you've ran the race. And we're so grateful that you've done that work. Let the next person run the next 100 meters. Because the fact of the matter is, I'm replaceable. You see, when you realize you're replaceable, you're willing to recognize, hey, that person might be able to do a better job. If the church board were to come together and say, you know, Reggie, it's time for you, you've done your work, and we have another candidate that we'd like to bring on, praise the Lord. i got to pass the baton. God must have something else for me to do, but right now, this is not it. But I can't hold on to the baton. It's like, no, I still want to go. I want to run. I still, I still got work to do. No, no. Churches come together and decided. That might be you. It's okay. Pass the baton. You can have other things to do. Maybe God has a different work for you to do. And I, I hear this in the church all the time, people holding on to their positions like it's their life. It's my friends. You can do it. It might end up like a Hezekiah. It's like, hey, I, I, I'm burnt out. I'm, I, I've lost my sight of God and my sense of mission. And when our eyes are on the Lord, when our eyes are on the mission that we are here to rescue the perishing, to care for the dying, well, hey, I can't get to the next 200 meters in time. You'll get there faster. You take the baton. Are you okay with that? Because now, see, we're cooperating. We're not competing. And in such a way, we can finish the work. And to the younger folks, there are so many younger folks I hear from you, and that's, you know, but I hear that you don't want to come to church because the people are hypocrites. Find me a place where you've never seen a hypocrite. Not even when you walk into the room of, by yourself and you look in the mirror, there's still one hypocrite in the room. People are not perfect. If you're looking for a place, I've done this sermon a bunch of times before, so I won't go into it, but people aren't perfect. It's just not the case. What is it that you're looking for? And I've told this before, before God doesn't always call people because they are saved, but in order to save them. And so he calls people into the church. And if you think the church's standard is the people it consists of, you are entirely off. The church's standard is the head of the church, who is who? Christ. He is the standard. Some of us, we don't, we, we don't, we, 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 and that's why we're here. We say, God, I need you, I need you, I need you. And so when you look at the church and see that it's substandard, that they aren't reaching the standard, that it's falling, people within it are falling short of the standard, Remember, even Christ came and cleansed the sanctuary twice when he came, but he didn't get rid of the church. People aren't perfect. And if that's one of you young people or a young person you know, let them know. We're coming here to learn how to cooperate, to be able to fulfill the image of God. We are not there yet, but we need each of you to be a part of it to help us get there. Secondly, oops, uh, forget church is not entertainment. I'll get, that, get, get, there, get there first. Looks like my... You are capable. What do I mean by that? My friends, young people, you may not think you have ability, but you do. You may be using your abilities for something other than the furtherance of God's gospel, but I can tell you there are things you are doing in your everyday life that are actually helpful in progressing, and not progressing, in pushing forward the gospel to people who don't know. There is a sphere of influence that you have that I could never reach. But the thing is, if you don't think you're able because you're not able to pray like someone prays, because you're not able to sing like someone sings, let me tell you, you have something that God has given you because he's going to use you. And what you need, I know, because I'm going to give you my testimony, is you just need an opportunity. You see, uh, for those of you that like sports, I, I enjoy watching sports. One of the sports is, and when it comes to sports, the things they have is a draft. I'm speaking to my young people, older folks, if you don't know what I'm talking about. Hold on for just three minutes. You have a draft where you draft rookies out of college. Rookies, the new guys who are 21, 22 years old, fresh legs. But those teams then don't go and fire all of their over 30 folks. What do they do? 
Those young people come on board because they need them to run to be able to do the things they can do at their age. But you need the wisdom of someone like a, a quarterback who's 35 or 37 years old who can see things way before they happen because they've seen it before. But you may not get into the game until, unfortunately in sports, somebody might get injured. The person who had the position for 10 years suddenly gets injured and now, it's your t- it's, now you're getting the opportunity. And that person comes in and they get the opportunity to, to catch a ball, to run the ball, to, to, shoot, to shoot finally because of that. And they go, wow, this person's a star. Or wow, this person really knows how it, they, they can actually play. I didn't know that they could play like this. It's the same thing with you. When it came to me, a church many years ago gave, gave me and my friends an opportunity to start our own ministry where we kind of had our own purview of watching and we did outreach ministry that had a, a worship component, but the focus was outreach. And it allowed me, that's when I got the ability to be able to say, maybe I, I'll try to preach, guys. Uh, I used to write a lot, but I never got the opportunity to preach. And only at 21 or so, 20, I was 20, that I got the first time to actually put a sermon together and preach. And that was, you know, 15 years ago. But if I, I, I know if I never got that opportunity from that church to be able to do that ministry for over seven years, where we were basic, there was basically no supervision from the, from the very, very top. They knew what we were doing. We made sure everything was reverent and all those types of things. But that gave us the opportunity to spread our wings a little bit. And that's the only reason I stand before you here today, because of an opportunity. But those opportunities can only present themselves when we give it to our young people. They may fail, they may do the wrong thing or say the wrong theological thing sometimes up here, you know, we know. Don't, don't get on them for it. You know, they're still learning as well. There's things I said when I was 20 and 21 and when I go back, we had recorded it back in the day and I was like, whoa, I can't believe I said, I said that. Uh, that's not actually what I meant or I learned that that was not true. But without the ability, I, only then I learned I had public speaking skills. Previous to that, I never did public speaking. I would write. That was my, I like to write. And so I tell you, you're capable. When you get the opportunity, don't pass it up. And I'll tell you this other thing from experience. Once you start taking advantage of the opportunities God brings into your life as a young person when it comes to doing ministry, you're going to find out there are things you can do that you never thought you could. All of a sudden, things start opening up. Like, well, I didn't know it like that. I'll give you my, my thing. My family comes from a history of terrible musicians. We don't have a music, musical bone in our body. But most of us, we're athletic. We like to play sports. We can run fast. We can do all those kinds of things. But music, oof. If you want us to sing happy birthday, we can sing it for you in five different keys. And we didn't intend on it, and we do it all at the same time. But then I didn't realize that I liked being a worship leader until I got the opportunity at this church. Now, you may notice that when we're singing, I may not always be singing into the mic because I can't really sing that well. <laughs> so you might see them like, why isn't Reg singing? It's because Reg is not a great singer. But Reg can do worship leading. I, I can get you uh, 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 to a point where you enjoy singing. And maybe you sing better than I do. But I didn't know that until I got the opportunity. You see what I'm saying? Those opportunities are so important that you'll be able to find when you say yes to God, he'll open up more doors. Finally, church is not entertainment. I'm almost done here. Church is not entertainment. I know, young people, you want to be entertained. There's a movie that says, are you not entertained? And sometimes you want to be entertained. And you think church is the place for it. I'll tell you that. Entertainment loses its flavor. What do you do once you're entertained? Oh, that was a great game. What's the next one? That's a great thing to do. Okay, what's the next thing? And all of a sudden, you just want to be excited the whole time. But that's not what church is. Church is a place to enjoy the presence of God and his people. Entertainment, I'm telling you. Think about all the shows you've watched a year ago and you don't even remember it. You were entertained for the time. You don't even remember the names of the main characters. That's what happens because all you were was entertained. What we want to be able to do is create, as the Bible says, you've heard this verse before, Acts 20 verse 35, it is more blessed to give than to receive. I want you to think of that when it comes to church when it comes to your families. It is better to give than to receive. We must be givers, not consumers of church. You see, when we come into church, if all we're thinking, you know, we had a great week, things are going, if all we're thinking, oh, I can't wait to get this, 
from the sermon. I can't wait to get this from that person that's going to smile for me. I need a smile from that person today. I really do. Got it. Okay, great. Oh, I'm going to need an amen from that person when I preach. Okay, got it. I got it. And all we want to do is consume, but we have nothing to give. And when you look at church that way, after you've consumed all you can, what will you say? Church is boring. I'm done with church. Why am I going to church? There's no reason. Because you think of church as a place to consume. I want to tell you, once you've consumed, church is a place to give. And when you come in and say, you know, I'm going to go to church today, and I'm going to give everyone the biggest smile they've ever seen, because I had a good week. I'm going to give something at church. I'm going to give a hug to that person when there's no social distancing. I'm going to be able to do that. I'm going to sing these songs with all that I have to give so the person that's next to me can feel encouraged. I'm going to come into a church board meeting and be, give, have something to give and not just something to take. And when we become givers instead of consumers, your whole outlook on church will change. There are some of you that no longer attend church because you have consumed all that church has to give to you. Well, if you have, then it's time for you to give to the person who's come to church that needs something to consume. Does that make sense? If you only come to consume, at some point you'll be so full that you'll not want to come anymore and that's why you're not here. That's so why people say church is irrelevant. It's because you missed the point. <laughs> church is not a place where you consume. Church is a place where you give yourself because we are reflecting the image of God, the one who is the giver of all good gifts, not the taker of all good gifts. Be a giver, not a consumer. One of the purposes of the church is to seek and to save that which is lost, to prepare a people of all ages, backgrounds, ethnicities for the soon return of Jesus Christ. Our priority must not be to maintain tradition at the expense of losing an entire generation. On the other hand, our priority must not be to pander to the preferences and tastes of every generation that will come because that will not win them. What will win them is truth. You see, you can go many places to be entertained. You can go many places to be filled. You can go to a restaurant and be filled. But the place where you can rely on to hear truth will be church. That's what sets it apart from the rest of the world. That's why truth wins. It may not always be entertaining, but it is attractive. It may not always get you excited, but let me tell you, it's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. Truth is what sets the church apart, and that is what will attract the youth. When we don't just present truth in the, what Mrs. White says, an irksome way, something that it doesn't seem attractive, but in fact, like I talked about last week, when we present truth as Jesus did, our young people are like, wow, that's amazing. That's beautiful. That's awesome. Woo! I want to go to church next week, too. That is the kind of truth. See, truth is truth. But how we then present that truth must be led by the word of God. And Jesus was the best truth teller there ever was. That's why so many people would flock to him, no matter what age, no matter what socioeconomic status, they'd be like, I got to hear what he's got to say, whether you're a Sadducee or a Pharisee, whether you were wealthy, whether you were poor, whether you were sick or well, you wanted to hear Jesus because of the way he would tell the truth, not because he entertained people. Young people, older people. That's what will win them. I'm not saying to ever change the truth. No, I'm saying how we present it sometimes, we have to be excited about the truth because only then they'll be excited. Mrs. White, like I said last week, told us that parents make your home worship the, most, the, most, uh, the best time at home. Children should look forward to having worship with you at home. But what we've done is we made it run and dry, and she actually uses the word dry. We've made it dry. And so... What is church? It's an extension of the home in terms of worship. And so if they think church or home worship is boring, why would they want to come to church? So we have a part to play, my friends. Truth will win them. Truth will not. It must not change because it is the only thing that will win a lost generation. But traditions and methods, they can be rethought. The church must be willing to fill the needs of the next generation by showing them the fulfiller who can give them identity, purpose, and meaning. They're looking for that truth. Mrs. White says in uh, Review and Herald, March 1, 1887, we must be laborers together with God, for God will not complete his work without human agencies. Woo! 
Oof. God wants to use you. And when we cooperate with each other instead of compete with each other, when we recognize that this is a race, you know, we're gonna, I, I've got this first part of the race, I'm going to run it, and I've run as best as I can. As best as I can, Cliff. Clifton, I've got to pass this off to you. Sid, this is the best I've been able to run, man. Uh, I'm getting on my last legs. I'm running out of breath. I'm going to pass the baton to you, and I'm going to trust that you'll do the work. Why? Because God's in charge, not me. Why should I be nervous? God's going to fulfill his work with human agencies. It doesn't say that God's going to complete his work with Reggie. No, Reggie's time is done. Now is your time. The song says, as I close for today, rescue the perishing, care for the dying. The song does not say rescue the saved, care for the living. <laughs> That's what happens when we live status quo, when all we do is we just want to keep the way that things are. The fact of the matter is, it says rescue the perishing. What are we doing to rescue the perishing? Maybe the method we were using before is not working as best as it used to. And so what we need to do is change the method so we can rescue the perishing. Because all right now we're caring about is the saved. Yeah, the saved are staying in church, but the perishing are perishing. <laughs> well, we got to do something about that, God. Teach us, tell us what to do. May we be open to old and new ways of doing things so that we may rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful. Reggie's not going to save. Jesus will save. Lord, teach us, Lord, to cooperate. Teach us to run that relay race in such a way that this church, your church, wherever you may be, can truly say we're rescuing the perishing. We're caring for the dying. Jesus is merciful. Jesus will save. Amen. Care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. We pour the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Oh, they are smiting him, still he is waiting, waiting the penitent child to receive. Lead with him earnestly, lead with them gently, he will forgive if they Our most gracious, beautiful, wonderful Savior. Teach us, Lord, to reflect your image wherever it may be. And collectively, may we be able to share that image that when others look in, they'll say, yes, yes, 
I see the image of God in the midst of all these different people from different ages, different ethnicities, different ideas coming together in such a way that I've never seen. It must be the presence of God in that place. Lord, I pray right now for a wayward person, a child, a mother has been praying for a child, Lord. Prick that child's heart right now. We may have failed them. We may have said the wrong thing to them. We may have hurt them. We may have just neglected them. And now they're out of the church. Lord, prick their heart and bring them back and give us another chance to tell them about the truth of Jesus. And that they may now see this church and many churches around the world changed in such a way that they know that this place is different from every other place in this world. And that in the body of Christ, there is life, there is power, there is truth. Help us to rescue the perishing, to care for the dying, and use us to finish your work, is my prayer in Jesus' name. This, the last Sabbath of 2020. We're so grateful that you chose to stick around with us throughout this year in a very interesting, different year. But we're so glad that we got to make contact with you if this was the first time you got to visit with Remnant Seventh-day Adventist Church. And we want to let you know that no matter where you are, you are part of this church family. And as we heard today, we just remember from my heart, old and new together. No matter what church you may be in, if you've been a person who's been the competitive person, who's been the complainer, I, I, I invite you, in 2021, remember, you bring in a piece of the image of God. And so maybe we be a church of cooperation and not competition. To help other ministries that may not be our ministry, to let them know they're just as important as you are. And in such a way, we'll be able to win more and more for the soon return of our Savior. And in that way, our young people, when they return, they'll see a changed church. One that will embrace them the way Jesus embraced you. The way that the Father embraced the prodigal son. I hope you were blessed. And we thank you so much for your continued ministry, uh, continued support of this ministry. Whether it be by your prayers, by letting people know about this church, by sending the link to them that they can worship with us as well, or if it's by your financial contributions. We appreciate, appreciate every one of those. And I want to say a special hello to those that have worshipped with us online. I just have a few names here. Um, Dow Taylor in Saskatchewan, Stacey Ann Martin, Ruth Charmaine, Elizabeth, Sonny Jack in Canada, Joseph Surley, Rebecca, Karen Roberts, Leon, Barbara Marie in Mountain View, California, Hepsi Joseph, Susan Rose, Wilma Patterson, Premila James, Rosa Wilson, and many, many others. We thank you so much for joining with us. We pray that this church has been a blessing to you throughout this year. And we want to remind you, if you'd like to submit a financial contribution to the church, you can visit our church website online and click on the tab for giving. Or you can mail a check. Our mailing address is also on the church website. Remember, as the pastor said, if you mark it by December 31st, 2020, you'll be able to count it toward your tax-deductible gift. Thank you for being a part of the Remnant Church. You truly are a blessing to us. And we look forward to continuing to minister to you in 2021. Stay safe and happy Sabbath.